I want to thank Mike Chapman. There's, there's an old expression, uh, it's not an adventure until something goes wrong. <laughs> Mike has made this adventure uh, work for us. He got the slides up and I appreciate that. In 1965, Texas novelist William Humphrey wrote, if the Civil War is more alive to the Southerner than to the Northerner, it's because all of the past is. And this is so because the Southerner has a sense of having been present there himself in the person of one or more of his ancestors. The war filled merely a chapter in his family history, transmitted orally from father to son as the Proverbs prophecies, legends, laws, traditions of origins, and tales of wanderings of his own tribe. It is this feeling of identity with the dead who are past which characterizes and explains the Southerner. It is with kin, not causes, that the Southerner is linked. Confederate great-grandfather is not remembered for his probably undistinguished part in the Battle of Bull Run. Rather, Bull Run is remembered because great-grandfather was there. For the Southerner, the Civil War, or the war between the states, is in the family. Clannishness was and is the key to his temperament. And he went off to war to protect not Alabama, but only those 30 or 40 acres of its sandy hillside or stiff red clay which he broke his back tilling and which was as big a country as his mind could hold. Undoubtedly, Humphrey was revealing feelings carried forward from his Texas childhood memories in the 1930s. Back then, a few veterans were still alive to pass along the family lore to grandchildren like Bill. He later used those mem memories to portray an incident in his best known novel, Home from the Hill, which Vincente Minnelli made into a movie in 1960. About 20 years after the war, a foppish stranger stepped off the Dallas bound train when it stopped in Clarksville. Even though he spoke English, none of the whittlers at the station could understand him, which they later learned was due to his Italian accent. But eventually the stranger who identified himself as a professor was granted an audience with the alderman, during which he explained that he could build a marble monument to the Confederate infantryman for $5,000. For $25,000, he could erect one depend, uh, depicting a mounted cavalryman or an officer. The town chose the $5,000 option. <laughs> After the professor labored creatively and submitted a finished design, the alderman gave him a $2,500 deposit. A year later, he returned with the sculpted components and erected the statue. The unveiling was a celebration that attracted nearly everyone in town, white and black. A good many years elapsed before anyone from Clarksville traveled far along the railroad from whence the sculptor had arrived. But when one <clears throat> resident eventually traveled to Georgia, he noticed that there was, quote, Hardly a town of monument aspiration size along the railway line, all the way to Atlanta, without a copy of our statue. <laughs> Close quote. Statue critics say the Confederate soldier fought for slavery, but fewer than 30% of Southern families owned slaves, and either fewer and even a smaller percentage owned them directly. In truth, According to historian William C. Davis, quote, the widespread northern myth that the Confederates went to the battlefield to perpetuate slavery is just that, a myth. Their letters and diaries in the tens of thousands reveal again and again they fought because their southern homeland was invaded, close quote. 
This historian Davis is respected north and south. Moreover, when their impoverished families finally were able to collect enough money to erect memorials, they honored the soldier for his battlefield sacrifices. It's obvious in the words contained in the monument inscriptions. A typical example is on the Silent Sam statue torn down two years ago by a mob of Chapel Hill University of North Carolina students. It reads, to the sons of the university who entered the war of 1861-65 in answer to the call of their country and whose lives taught the lesson of their great commander, that being Robert E. Lee, that duty is the sublimest word in the English language. Honorable sentiments erased by political correctness. When the inscriptions did address Southern causes, they tended to focus on constitutional rights such as limited government and state sovereignty. One example from a statue removed in St. Louis reads, to the memory of the soldiers and sailors of the Southern Confederacy who fought to uphold the right declared by the pen of Jefferson and achieved by the sword of Washington with sublime self-sacrifice, they battled to preserve the independence of the states which was won from Great Britain and to perpetuate the constitutional government which was established by their fathers. Valid points surrendered to the big government dogma of our age. Knoxville unveiled her first Confederate statue in 1892, which was well ahead of most other southern towns. Since that was only 27 years after the war had ended, the dedication speaker was undoubtedly acquainted with many veterans when he said, quote, the Southern soldier believed his allegiance was due first to his state and then to the general government. So when his state called for his service, he responded, believing it to be his duty, close quote. Nonetheless, he added, quote, I am persuaded that the soldier from Mississippi or Louisiana in 1892 would give his life in defense of his country today as readily as one from Massachusetts or Maine." Close quote. Finally, he quotes a mother's elegy that serves as a soldier's epitaph. What need of question now whether he was wrong or right? He wields no warlike weapons now returns no foeman's thrust, who but a coward would revile an honest soldier's dust? Brave words that too many of today's academic historians defy behind tenured sinecures to their everlasting shame. Few today comprehend the magnitude of the Confederate soldier's sacrifice. About 300 Confederate soldiers died when the region's population was only 9 million and only 6 million whites. If the United States were to suffer proportional casualties in a war today, our losses would total 11 million, which would be 26 times greater than our dead of World War II. Given such oblations, the Confederate soldier's surviving family members wanted, naturally, to memorialize him. Memorial Day evolved after federal occupation troops observed Southern women spreading flowers upon the graves of their husbands, sons, and brothers during the war. A year after the war, the ladies of Columbus, Mississippi, and I know Columbus, Georgia will dispute this, strewed flowers on the graves of both the Confederate and Union dead, both Confederate and Union dead, in the town's Friendship Cemetery, 
a year after the war. Their gesture started a movement that spread and in the North, May 30th became selected as National Memorial Day in 1868. Since the war had impoverished the South, the Southern ladies could do little more than lay down flowers. There was no money for statues, and Union veterans initially opposed con permanent Confederate memorials. But when the sons of the Confederate veterans eagerly joined the U.S. Army to help win the Spanish-American War, the aging Union Civil War soldiers concluded that their former rivals were also Americans deserving a memorial recognition. Thus, the 20 years from 1898 to 1918 witnessed the installation of 80% of the signature courthouse square Confederate statues still standing in many southern towns. During that period, the typical surviving Confederate soldier aged from 58 years to 78 years. Memorial placements, north and south, surged between 1911 and 1915 because it was the war's semi-centennial and the old soldiers were fading away. Today, a vocal minority holds the Confederate soldiers in contempt, much like the many Americans who sneered at the returning Vietnam veterans of the 1960s. Mixed in with chants of, hey, hey, LBJ, how many babies did you kill today? Some mocked the returning soldiers. Today, most Americans old enough to remember cringe with shame when recalling such incidents. As reported in the New York Times, for example, in 1968, a one-armed vet was accosted at a Colorado college. Pointing to the missing limb, another student asked, did you get that in Vietnam? The veteran said, yes, serves you right, said the student. It took years, but eventually the public abandoned the ridiculers and gave the Vietnam vets their due credit thereby underscoring the maxim, quote, whoever marries the spirit of this age will find himself a widower in the next, close quote. Thus, we should be aware that decisions to tear down century-old monuments puts us at risk for future remorse. Dishonoring such monuments demeans later generations of American warriors who were inspired by the courage of the Confederate soldier. Consider, for example, that post-war Southerners consistently came to the nation's defense, the USA's defense, more readily than did other Americans. Even presently, 44% of American military personnel are from the South, notwithstanding that it represents just 30%, 36% of the nation's population. Tennessee's Alvin York was America's most famous infantryman in World War I. Although his grandfather was a Union deserter, two of his grand uncles sided with the Confederacy. Texan Audie Murphy was the most decorated soldier in World War II. In Vietnam, Arkansas sniper Carlos Hathcock killed more enemy than, and even put a bullet in the eye of an opposing sniper through the foe's telescopic sight. Steven Spielberg theatrically copied this in Saving Private Ryan, as many of us know. Each man was born into grinding poverty that typified much of the South for a century after the Civil War. As boys, they hunted for game, and they hunted for food, not sport. This is the Confederate soldier. This is the, what the Confederate soldier inspired. This is what kept us safe from, in our military activities. During World War II, 
the first American flag to fly over the captured Japanese fortress at Okinawa was a Confederate battle flag. It was put there by a group of Marines, North and South, to honor their company commander, who happened to be a South Carolinian and who suffered a paralyzing wound in the victorious assault. Some of the tank crews that freed prisoners from German concentration camps also flew the Confederate battle flag. When we tear down Confederate monuments, we disgrace warriors like that. The academic community is at the forefront of those wanting to remove Confederate statues, which they characterize as racist. In doing so, they violate the American Historical Society's warning against, quote, presentism, close quote, which is defined as the uncritical tendency to interpret the past in terms of modern values. It fails to recognize that racial attitudes throughout America 150 years ago were different than they were today, they are today. That is why Abraham Lincoln said during an 1858 debate, quote, I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. I also sent you an email earlier today to show you that during the period when Confederate monuments were put up, even the North was racist. They, support, they supported the great white hope against boxer Jax Johnson, who was black and the champion. Finally, toppling Confederate statues has evolved into a mob sport with impunity for the vandals. Since such conduct requires no more bravery than kicking a puppy, we may wonder what comes next. Arcata, California has already removed a statue of President McKinley. Notre Dame University has covered a mural that celebrates Christopher Columbus's discovery voyages. Anti-statue activists are behaving much like the leaders of the former Soviet Union where censorship and rewritten history was part of the state's effort to ensure that the correct, the correct political spin was put on their history. In response, George Orwell wrote, quote, the most effective way to destroy a people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history, close quote. One argument used by those wanting to remove or tear down Confederate statues is that contemporary blacks had little chance to impose them when they were erected. Aside from anecdotal evidence that blacks joined white crowds to observe the dedication ceremonies as they did in Clarksville, Texas, one example in Mississippi provides undeniable evidence of explicit high-level black support in 1890, the Mississippi legislator voted on a bill to appropriate $10,000 for, for a Confederate monument. The vote in the lower chamber was 57 to 41 in favor. All six black representatives voted yay. One, John F. Harris, made a supporting speech prior to the vote. Quote, Mr. Speaker, I have risen here in my place to offer a few words on the bill. I was sorry to hear the speech of the young gentleman from Marshall County. I am sorry that any son of a soldier should go on record as opposed to the erection of a monument in honor of the brave dead. And, sir, I am convinced that had he seen what I saw at Seven Pines, and in the seven days fighting around Richmond, the battlefield covered with the mangled forms of those who fought for their country's honor. He would not have made that speech. When the news came that the South had been invaded, those men went forth to fight for what they believed. And they made no requests for monuments, but they died and their virtues should be remembered. Sir, I went with them. I too wore the gray. 
the same color my master wore. We stayed four long years, and if that war had gone on till now, I would have been there yet. I want to honor those brave men who died for their convictions. When my mother died, I was a boy. Who, sir, then acted the part of a mother to an orphaned slave boy, but my old missus. Were she living now, or could speak to me from those high realms where are gathered the sainted dead, she would tell me to vote for this bill. And, sir, I shall vote for it. I want it known to all the world that my voice is given in favor of the bill to erect a monument in honor of the Confederate dead." Close quote. Well, who was Harris? Harris was about 30 years old when he went off with his master to fight on the side of the Confederacy. After the war, he studied law at the offices of Percy and Yerger in Greenville, Mississippi. We heard a little bit about Percy, didn't we? The firm's founder, William Alexander Percy, was a former Confederate colonel. In 1867, Percy successfully defended ex-slave Holt Collier, who had been accused of murdering a federal officer during the occupation years. Holt fought as a Confederate sharpshooter during the war and was later a guide for Theodore Roosevelt when the President visited Mississippi on a bear hunt in 1902. When word got out that Roosevelt declined to shoot a bear that Holt had trapped for him, a toy manufacturer started mass producing stuffed bears for infants, and he named them teddy bears. <laughs> Percy's son, Leroy, fathered a second William Alexander Percy who authored Lanterns on the Levee in 1941. When future novelist and physician Walker Percy was orphaned at age 15 in 1931, we've heard some of this, he went to live with his older cousin, the second W.A. Percy. While in Greenville, Walker became friends with high school classmate Shelby Foote, who had been fatherless since the age of five. During the next three years, the two youths were treated like nuclear family in the Percy household. The patriarch adopted Walker and became a mentor to Shelby. Later, Walker won the National Book Award for The Moviegoer, while Shelby became best known for his three-volume narrative of the Civil War. The Southern Poverty Law Center, boo, boo. <laughs> once Confederate statues removed from public places. Several years ago, they published this chart depicting the dates when Confederate statues were erected. As you may see, they attempt to associate the construction of Confederate statues with three eras, three eras, three periods, they claim correlate to white hostility towards blacks. The attempts are as phony as a football bat. <laughs> the SPLC portrays the first 20-year period from 1880 to 1900 as a time when Southern blacks lost voting rights and Jim Crow was enacted. Their case for this period is weak because comparatively few statues were assembled at that time. Similarly, Jim Crow, Jim Crow voting rights issues largely applied only to the second half of that period, from 1890 to 1900, not from 80 to 90. Many more statues, as you can see from the graph, were constructed from 1900 to 1920, which the SPLC falsely correlates to racial lynching and the resurgent KKK. In reality, lynchings were steadily declining during the entire period from 1900 to 1920. And the, and the KKK was not resurgent until after 1920. Moreover, the, revive, the revived KKK was a national, not regional phenomenon. Indiana had more KKK members than any state 
while Oregon, Kansas, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Washington, and Ohio were other strongholds outside the South. In truth, four factors that the SPLC evades or ignores caused the building surge during the 1900 to 1920 interval. First and foremost, since the old soldiers were dying off, family members wanted to honor them while they were still around. Who can really doubt that? Who, what rational person can really doubt that? A 21-year-old who went to war in 1861 was 60 years old in 1900 and 75 in 1915. Second, the Civil War's semicentennial commemoration was a major factor motivating statue construction. 1911 marked the 50th anniversary of the start of the war and 1915 the 50th anniversary of its end. Third, both of the preceding points contributed to a simultaneous surge in the number of statues erected for Union heroes, Union war heroes. It is only natural that Confederate descendants wanted to follow suit at the same time. Fourth, Post-war impoverished Southerners generally did not have enough money to pay for memorials until the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Notwithstanding its population growth, the region did not recover its pre-war level of economic activity until 1900. The output of the entire region did not recover to the 1960, 1860 level until 40 years later in 1900 despite the increase in population. Few people today appreciate the efforts required to fund the century-old statues. A typical example is the 1905 monument in Chester, South Carolina. When erected, blacks accounted for 40% of the town's 4,500 people, as compared to 60% of its present 5,000 population. Fundraising began the year the war ended in 1865 when school children were able to raise pocket change. A second effort five years later collected only a few dollars. In 1890, a Chester woman raised $200 with a theatrical performance. Finally, in 1900, the United Daughters of the Confederacy took charge, and by the end of 1904, they had about $420. Next, the UDC included a public uh, uh, induced a public subscription involving many small donations from Chester residents, including some blacks. That increased the Treasury to $2,100, which was enough to pay for this monument. In May 1905, they laid the cornerstone before a crowd that also included a minority of African Americans. But to return to the SPLC's analysis, consider the third surge of statue placements during the 1960s. The Poverty Center fallaciously attributes the surge in the 1960s to white protest against school integration. Martin Luther King's civil rights and, civil, and Martin Luther King's civil rights movement. In reality, the SPLC's own graph shows that the erection of new statues during the 1960s was a minor swell compared to the semicentennial of 50 years earlier. Moreover, it is most likely that it reflected the centennial commemoration itself as evidenced by the fact that the United States Post Office issued five commemorative Civil War stamps between 1961 and 1965. There's little doubt that the United States Postal Service issued those stamps to commemorate segregation or to celebrate segregation. This chart underscores the importance of the semicentennial and the dwindling veteran population as a prime motivate as a prime as prime motivating factors for erecting the signature public square statues. The yellow bars represents the statues on courthouse grounds as opposed to cemeteries, battlefields, or private property. So the yellow is those are the signature statues that we see in the little courthouse squares. As may be seen, they are heavily concentrated in the semicentennial era. There can be little doubt that they were built with some urgency caused by the shrinking number of vets. 
I don't see how anyone who is not cynical, who is, who is not cynical, can conclude otherwise. Unfortunately, most academic historians are cynics. Remarks by Mercer University's Dr. Sarah Gardner reveal good examples. Quote, it took the Norse abandonment of Reconstruction, she argues, before Confederate apologists could enshrine their views in public squares. No, Dr. Gardner, in reality, since the carpetbag regimes ended only a dozen years after the war, it's obvious that the lingering Southern poverty was the chief reason that most Confederate statue building was delayed until the 20th century. Even though she admits that 90% of Confederate statues were erected between eight, uh, after 1895, she concludes, quote, the purpose of these statues was not to honor the Confederate dead, but to assert and celebrate white supremacy in the present, close quote. No, Dr. Gardner, since the most active statue building part of that period also coincided with the dwindling ranks of Confederate veterans, only a cynic could reach your conclusion. Finally, she argues that the long delayed work on the Davis Lee Jackson carvings at Stone Mountain in 1963 had, quote, nothing to do with honoring the Confederate dead of the 1860s and everything to do with asserting white supremacy in the 1960s, close quote. No, Dr. Gardner, since 1963 was 100 years after the war's midpoint, it is more likely that the centennial commemoration triggered a restart of the Stone Mountain carvings. Rather than taking down Confederate monuments, we should be adding new ones that address the subjects of slavery, the Underground Railroad, black soldiers, and Reconstruction, as well as Jim Crow, and later Civil Rights Era. I got no problem with putting up more statues to celebrate those things. But I don't want to take down Confederate monuments. Having both shows how things changed. Destroying one and putting up the other creates a false impression of what really happened. Adding new monuments for more recent heroes while keeping the old ones in place provides a tangible record of how our society evolved. Such trends had already been in place long before Dylan Ruth provided the cultural elite an excuse to tear down Confederate symbols in 2015. In 2007, for example, Arkansas erected statues on its state capitol grounds to the nine black teenagers who integrated Little Rock Central High 50 years earlier in 1957. Yet on those same Capitol grounds, there's a statue to the Confederate soldier and a statue to the Confederate women. Similarly, Richmond, Virginia honored pioneering black player Arthur Ashe even earlier in 1996. They built a statue of him on Monument Avenue, which has chiefly populated by Confederate heroes. Consider also street name memorials to Martin Luther King. I was talking with Gary about this earlier. Former Confederate states have far more MLK streets than similarly sized northern states. North Carolina and New Jersey, for example, have comparable populations. But the southern state has 29 MLK streets, where the northern one has only eight. Similarly, even though Ohio has four times the population of Mississippi, the Buckeye State has eight MLK streets, whereas the state with the Confederate banner, with the Confederate battle flag in its banner, has 16. I struggled for a way to end this speech on a positive note until I read a recent blog post by Richard Williams at Relics and Bones. He quoted the wisdom of Will Durant, who said, quote, to speak ill of others is a dishonest way of praising ourselves, close quote. To tear down Confederate monuments is a dishonest way to elevate your own narcissism. Thus, even though pictures of students triumphantly kicking a fallen statue may anger us, Durant's quote indicates that con their conduct is really a grotesque display of narcissism. <laughs>
Although saving Confederate statues may be hard, we must try. Never think your corner of the world is too small to have an impact, even if that part is simply your own family circle. And that's what I have to say.